Hey folks, how you doing? It's Mark. And I'm back again with another one of This Is How We Did It, but this is volume 25 now, so we're getting on there, quarter century. Um, and today we're going to be talking about an album that was very important for Grand Central and Manchester at the time. Uh, it's an album called Central Heating. We're going to have a bit of a listening uh, party with it, as it were. A bit shorter, but talking about how things were made and some of the history of Manchester's studios at the time and what inner city um, revival of uh, buildings can do for the creative arts, which is essentially the broader thing here. So this is the album we're going to be talking about. Um, it came out in 1996, so that's almost a quarter of a century ago. And it's important for lots of different reasons. Um, it's the first design that Andy Votel did for the label, and it's uh, absolutely stunning. There's a radiator on the inside with all of the artists who appear here, all of them very important for what was about to come. Um, I think that's his dad's cooker that she painted, and uh, that was a classic uh, emblem that he made there of the, uh, the old gas heater. Um, so... Basically, let's get stuck in. I've not done it like this before. Normally, it's talking about samples, which I will be doing. I just want to talk to you a little bit about some of the stories about how these tracks were made and about, you know, what it represents, what was happening. So, we're going to start off with the track Central Introduction, okay? I've got a, a, um, a task I want to set uh, you, at you. This is a Babe Ruth sample, but I don't know which track it is, so any Babe Ruth fans can help me. This is Central Introduction. Recorded at Lovenet Studios, SP twelve hundred in effect. Would you like to see my collection of classic bricks and beats? Yes, my friend, I would love to see them. No, my brother, you must get your own. Okay, so Tony was taking the mick out of the break, breakbeat hunting experience there. to leave him uh, alone uh, in the house on his own when he first arrived. And he used to watch Crystal Maze and he was as astonished by Crystal Maze. Okay, so this is, this is uh, mixed in Love Nat Studios. And that is where home is now in Manchester, okay? So it's over Whitworth Street. We had uh, Tony Wilson above us in, a, in an office. And um, Tony used to often come in the studio when Steve and I would, were mixing and he'd sort of look at us in a sort of bemused fashion and, and sort of think, I don't know who these dudes are, I'll just leave them to it. And this is where this track was done. It was quite a top range studio with like a SSL style desk. So we got a good sound out of there with the SP1200. So yeah, when Tony first arrived in the country, he'd never been outside of America before, and he said to me, do you use dollars over there? Um, and will I need a passport? And also he asked if we still use horses and <laughs> carriages rather than cars. So it's quite interesting. He arrived, he had a bottle of jupe in his in his baggage and it's it smashed. So for the rest of the stay, he, he, he smelt really strongly of this uh, incredible uh, aftershave. And he brought a mate with him who uh, had a penchant for hiding um, pornographic magazines in Ali Roy, my friend's uh, kitchen, so that when they all left, his uh, girlfriend at the time would be looking for a, a cookbook and find something terrible. So that was uh, all fun and games. Okay, so this is Central Introduction, essentially just a low slung hip hop beat to get us through, uh, through the intro. Now, what's up next? It's uh, one that will probably be perhaps the most memorable for quite a few of you. It's How Sweet It Is, which is myself and Mr. Scruff. Let's have a little listen. was made uh, by myself and Mr. Scruff 
and we we took it into Zombie Studios, which is uh, where, where Phil Kirby was based. Now, Phil Kirby was next to um, a studio that the Doves had um, on Blossom Street in Ancoats, okay? And it was where I wanted to talk about these buildings. Yeah, Lovenet also, an old mill building. This Blossom Street building was also part of the Industrial Revolution. Big red brick buildings that had all these rooms that we would take over to make studios and such like. Uh, but unfortunately that studio burned down, the Doves studio burned down. So this was made in the studio next door. I think that went the way of the fire as well. Anyway, Phil Kirby was a great engineer and drummer and uh, he helped Mr. Scruff and myself make this track. Just wanna play here where something comes from here, okay? For any of you who know Bismarcky, okay, who's one of the best uh, rappers, um, in my opinion, of hip hop's history because he added humor and he had such a flow Incredible. Anyway, the damn it, it feels good uh, to see people up on it comes from Vapors by Bismarck. So let's have a little listen to that. And all that mess. I remember when he first started to rock and try to get this job at a record shop. He was in it to win it, but the boss front and said, Sorry, Mr. Lee, but there's no help on it. Now my cuts on, still try on and on and on to the light breaks the dawn. To get this JLB in the fact, then it look right past him and be like, Next! Now for the year of eight to eight, cool B is making dollars so my cousins like straight. He walked into the same record shop right before, and of course, we like Vaughn. Welcome to my store, offering hammer dog, but now nah, he don't want it. Damn, it feels good to see people up on it. Cause I rem there you go, Bismarcky and Marley Marl, sampled by Mr. Scruff and Mark Ray there. The other samples in this one were, um, oh, is John Clemo, who's a saxophonist. Um, and the horns, I think I found them off some random jazz funk album, but whatever it is, this track traveled quite far um, vibes wise, because it's such a happy, feel good tune. And uh, it was a pleasure working with Mr. Scroff. We were very similar in our love of samples and chopping things up. Okay. So um, I know Mark Farina gave that, oh, and this is Millie Jackson. Okay, what have we got next? Right, here we go. So, um, Second Street Go Go. This is. Uh, anybody know what this sample is? Because I can't find it, and Tony would bring these discs. Yeah, Tony Man, these, these records that he sampled would have been all throughout uh, Morristown, Philadelphia, New Jersey. He took me to these record shops in, in, in Jersey, New Jersey, and they were just incredible places, like it's three stories high of, of records, and you have to get ladders to get to the top of the top records. And Tony would get up on the ladders and he'd pull out vinyl and, and he'd sniff it and he'd go, I think there's a sample on this one because we had this joke that you could smell uh, where samples were. But if anyone knows what um, Second Street Go Go sample is, then please let me know. We've got a Babe Ruth sample to find out as well, so it's up to you guys to help me out here. Tony used to breed Akita fighting Japanese fighting dogs, and when I went to see him once, um, his kitchen had this big plank of wood across it and uh, well, like a door and on the other side there was like eight Akita puppies that were like square and uh, that was incredible um, experience because the, the male dog uh, had a bit of a sleepwalking uh, incident and uh, ended up trying to move the male dog. I was lucky to survive to be honest with you. Um, so yeah Tony, brilliant to work with, he helped us a lot with this, we flew him out as described that Second Street Go Go classic tune. I have to consult the uh, vinyl sleeve here. Once again, a chance to look at Hotel's uh, beautiful design. By the way, on that design thing, tip, where's it gone? 
Here's uh, this is the the launch party flyer from um, the from Sankey Soap and uh, down in Subterranea and XL Records and Richard Russell were trying to sign us or whatever we were doing, Ray and Christian in particular, and um, it was a great gig because we had um, Charlene Spateri, Viva, uh, Tony D himself uh, with MCs, and uh, yeah, it was a good good show. Okay, so. What have we got now? I'll use my ears. So this is Only Child, who is otherwise known as Justin from the Una Bombers, okay? Now, Justin's a very interesting character because uh, he was a great help to me to navigate some of the concepts of the music industry because he had been the bass player in New Fast Automatic Daffodils, yeah? Or New Fads. So he'd been around the block. And here he is using an MPC-60 with chopped up keyboard parts and a nice big drum machine. Here we go. Okay, heavy beats and uh, live bass all chopped up and played. Um, as a programmed thing, mixed by Steve Christian, and uh, Justin had quite a strong um, French influence at the time, because remember there's a lot of stuff going on over there, DJ Cam, and uh, it was I suppose a golden era in French sampled music as well, with Daft Punk at the top end of that. Um, so yeah, Justin obviously worked with Luke to do electric chair, and electric bar, and then Volta, and now the takeover of the, the Refuge building, which has all been brilliantly successful, so excellent work from those guys, and it's nice to have been involved in releasing his music, because there's uh, some killer stuff he did for us. Okay, what's next? Okay, another Tony D one. This is uh, singing a song for my mother. Yeah, singing a song for my mother by um, Bohannon. But Chubby Grooves is on this. This is just such a warm and I don't know, it just feels so different, the sampling of these old 8-bit and 12-bit machines, um, it's, you can't really replace it with modern technology. Awesome. So, yeah, I went to visit Tony in, in Trenton, New Jersey, and Trenton's like a a new castle of Jersey, you know, all, ma all X manufacturing and metal making. Okay, Tony D again with It's Time To Help by Chubby Grooves, who now does chopped herring records and has really essentially done a great service to the history of hip hop has Chubby Grooves because he's basically taken loads of demos that never got released for no good reason other than perhaps the people weren't connected or whatever and from that um, we've got loads of unreleased music from this era yeah um, so let me look at what's next okay we've got Rain which is features Buffy Brock's uh, daughter of um, Victor Brox, and this is a bit more of a jazz vibe from Only Child Again. One thing that I think is important about remember about Justin's use of drum machines is that he he adapted the idea of pitching individual sounds through the pads on an MPC-60 very early on so a lot of his music is reuse of the same sample pitched. Storm on my 
So yeah, Buffy uh, came and sang for us and did a great job. She also sang later on in the Tony DLP. And uh, what's next? Okay. Okay. This is me and Scruff again. Classic break by the LA Boppers. Yeah. We used it before Fat Joe though. Okay. Although he won't be, won't be listening. Once again, Phil Kirby in that uh, Zombie Studios. Um, and uh, this is well, the first time I think I'd use such a scruff time stretched um, dollar bill, y'all. Dollar bill, y'all. Right down. Here we go. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, that's dollar bill like. 20 BPM lower than it should. Yeah, it's quite a soulful jam, that one. Okay, what's next? Okay, fun funky fresh few. If Damon Savage from Funky Fresh View is listening, which I hope he is, can you tell us what these samples were again? It's not like we'll get sued, is it? a hard electro track yeah so look anything can happen on this album and that's why I think it's important to remember what speaking about it from like a professional point of view an album like this is essentially about trying to give people the space to develop themselves yeah so it's not a whole album by Funky Fresh View or AIM or Rain Christian yet because we're not good enough okay we can do EPs we can do individual um, tracks, um, but to pull off a whole album was yet to come. So that's why these, um, you know, these these compilation albums were so important to to what the label became because they're testing grounds. They allow people to sharpen e their teeth, and also Steve Christian could help them with production um, and mixing, so they could go away and make different decisions again, as we all learn together, you know. And once again, you know, saying how it's important to remember the buildings these tracks were made in. They were Juicy House was a petticoat manufacturer's, you know, and coats that was a, probably old mills. All of these uh, derelict buildings became like recording studios. They're not anymore because, of course, we've had the digital revolution. So the industrial revolution, we moved into the empty buildings. And now, of course, we've all been thrown out by the digital revolution. But hey, you know, you get old uh, and you start to see these big moves. OK, so what have we got going on here? Let me just try and do it. Votel wasn't the best at uh, ordering. So this should be and is indeed Loop Dreams by AIM. So really great at sampling and putting loops together and putting loads of vocal detail around it. I think this is actually the beginning of um, Hoop Dreams. The bit of common. Great programming skills, arrangement, and choice of samples from Andy Turner, who's AIM. Lots of details so you don't get bored of loops going round. Great programmer, and I think a drummer as well in his day. Um, I want to concentrate more on the other track on here of his, though. So, uh, what's next? Okay, so... So, original of Spellbound. Wow, so this was Juicy House, 1996. An 18-year-old Bev comes into the studio and kind of drops the vocal um, almost in one take um, and breaks, we didn't have a pop shield, so she was like singing so hard into the mic that Steve was like, you know, altering the input levels as we, as we were on the fly. But uh, that was Bev, you know, she turned up and did this. Okay, so you've heard it's too much to comprehend, right? We've, we've done that track on here before, but what I wanted to do is, is share with you, we had a problem with Spellbound when we were writing it, okay? I mean, Bev had the chorus, 
you got me, you got me, so hooked up on your love and spellbound and all that. But the verses were a little bit sticky with what we were doing, so um, I pulled uh, uh, Sweet Power, Your Embrace by James Mason, which any jazz funk heads will know. So let's listen to this and you'll see there's a there's not a rip off but what there is is there is a learning of the timing that is used in this jazz funk track oh press solo here we go <laughs> It's too much to comprehend. Although the, the distance between the words, listen to the way this is sung here. So, like before, when I was saying about how compilation albums allow you to develop artists and just give them enough space to do their best couple of tracks or whatever. You know, also, when you work like this, you can use reference to other records to learn about songwriting. And you don't, you're not ripping them off. What you're doing is you're just learning about, say, for instance, distance between words or the way that phrasing is done. And, of course, this is what leads to problems um, in courts nowadays when people say, oh, that's, like, influenced by. Well, look, we're all influenced by each other. Without influence, we'd be nothing, you know? So these are important things to remember um, why and how we're all connected to each other through music okay so where are we tell you one thing now you can tell this was made by a DJ these uh, and I mean made as in I was in charge of the production process is that there's three pieces of vinyl here you know I mean who would waste their money while well, a DJ wants his records to sound good so that was uh, where we got with that okay <clears throat> so where are we now? We are coming up to... Right, okay, now this is amazing. This is uh, Andy Votel covering uh, Black Sabbath's Hand of Doom with Cleta John Rose. Um, and this was um, a kind of crazy experience. Uh, when, when Votel came in the studio, he was just a force unto himself, you know, like he had all different ideas. So I'll, I'll, I'll do, I'll sort of explain it now so I don't have to stop the record. But um, he, he, he did this thing where he went, <laughs> right? Okay, see if I can recreate it. It's quite hard to do, right? <laughs> but if you go, <laughs> right, if you do that into a stylus and sample it, you get like a sort of, strange tone that you can uh, put up and down the keys and uh, that's exactly what Andy was doing I was like what's he, what's going on here Steve and Steve Christian mixed this and uh, there he was uh, blowing trumpet noises down the stylus to create um, Hand of Doom okay I'm going to go I'm going to leave you to listen to this for a second and I'm going to be back in a second alright Black Sabbath being covered by Andy Votel. I kind of just, I loved working with Andy because uh, he was so like supremely confident and into what he was doing. You just let him go because uh, he does know what he's doing. Whoa, there's that blowing into the stylus thing. Check this out. I 
love it. It's madness. Um, and yeah, it was just incredible because he came in, did all this crazy stuff. I mean, I, I just well, just went with it because it, 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 I wanted it to be diverse and represent the artists that were around us. And, you know, Andy is a hip hop guy, you know, but he loves sampling. And obviously he does Finders Keepers now and has done Twisted Nerve. I have a funny story. So around about this time, like 1996, maybe a year later, um, <clears throat> he brought Badly, Dra Badly Drawn Boy around to my house to, you know, to, with the idea of me signing Badly Drawn Boy. <clears throat> and of a, we had a really good time and we had a right old laugh listening to sped up tapes of my mates talking rubbish. Um, with strange Burnley accents and that's about all we did and I think he was like well do you want to sign him and I was like it just didn't fit in with what I was doing I didn't get it really um, more fool me but you know I was much more into the beat side of things and uh, Bad John Boy was a brilliant singer songwriter so really that I missed a, a trick there but it just shows that I had my own vision and that's why this album is so special you know because you got Votel I think 19 he was 19 years old Andy Votel here Viva was 19 um, I was in my mid-twenties and, you know, it captures, you know, Mr. Scruff before he'd signed to Ninja Tune. It captures a moment and the way that it was made captures a moment in the history of the studios as well, as I was saying, when all those studios were being filled with, uh, all those old buildings were being fill, filled with studios that we don't get that like anymore. Right, what's next? Okay. All right, this is a, this got even more stories to do with it. Okay, so, um... This is Funky Fresh Few, and this is a track called Through These Veins, which if any of you saw Rain Christian live, you'd often see me making half a fool of myself doing the vocal version of this. So the idea with this was that I was going to um, New York and seeing Empire Management in like 94, when the group home album came out, I remember going into their offices, and um, I wanted to get like either J. Rue or some part of, of per the perverted monks to perform for Grand Central. So anyway, Steve Christian and Tony D mixed this Funky Bash Few track in Love Net. And we're supposed to get the vocals, so I saved up money and paid for a flight for Afu Ra. My name is. Yeah, it's going to come, I better stop. Um, paid for Afu Ra to come from New York to come and rhyme on top of this track, yeah? And uh, I got the information via fax, and uh, I either misread or the fax was smudged, and I waited for him in the wrong terminal. For So he was in this terminal one, and I was in terminal two, and he waited for 12 hours for me. I waited, I think, for four hours for him, and then I just thought he probably must be coming tomorrow. Anyway, he flew back the next, he flew back on the same day, uh, and said, he, you didn't meet me. And I thought, oh God, I've just thrown away, like, you know, a grand in flights. And, um, Anyway, eventually we got the vocal done in London. Uh, I've got a nice photograph of that of me in, in there with him. And he did the vocal on this beat, which is one of the best straight Brooklyn style hip hop beats the label had. And um, yeah, it was an incredible mistake to make on my behalf. But then I got, I got punished even more by the same mistake, right? So then he tells me once he's done the vocals, he's like, oh, all, all of this song is about Tekken on PlayStation. I was like, all right, cool. He said, have you got a PlayStation? I was like, no. Okay, then we'll go and get a PlayStation and get Tekken. So I did, you know, I'd do anything to make the music work, yeah? And uh, I had to go into the studio with Steve Christian and set Tekken up and then be on the landline phone to New York while um, Afu Ra was saying, okay, get Paul. Do a double twist turn A A B B C and you'll get a what yeah like that and put that at the beginning of the verse. So I'd be I'd sat there try to learn how to play Tekken until I got this right noise, which we then had to put into an Akai sampler and put in certain parts of the song. It's insanity, really, isn't it? But it was very good fun. Anyway, funky fresh view through these veins. And I, yes, I have told that story lots of times before, but it is pretty ridiculous. In the end, we did end up working with Jeru. Uh, with Ryan Christian and what have you, but uh, what a mess to make, yeah? What a mess to make of... I mean, can you imagine the feeling in your guts when, for the first time on the label's history, you're going to get an American rapper to come and work with you, and you leave him in an airport for a whole... <laughs> oh. <sighs> right, OK. We got through it. He was pretty cool. OK, right. 
So I've got some sampler hunting here. So basically, just to let you know all about this album around this time, uh, yeah, Ashley Heath was the editor of The Face, right? So basically, he um, had a girlfriend at the time who was friends with Ross Clark, who I did first priority with. And she used to come to our fever nights uh, down at the state and The Man Alive and all these things that were going on. Anyway, he then went on to date... Um, Charlene Spateri, and basically he had remembered our DJing reputation and the nights that we did, and then he, he heard our Far Side remix and Nightmares on Wax remix, and he said, hey, I want you to remix um, tech, this band, and he wouldn't tell me who this band were, right? So I had to, I had to go down to Soho. Uh, this, is around, this is around the same time, it would be 1995 or something. And I went down to Soho, and I met with Ashley Heath, and I, I met with this woman who... I had no idea who she was, um, and I spilt my pint over her and the entire table across this sushi restaurant, right? Everything, just lager everywhere. And I, and, and Ashley was talking to me about it, and he's saying, well, you know, so we've got this idea, we want you to do a remix, you know, to work with the band. And, of course, I had no idea who Texas were or, or Charlene Spateri were, so didn't really bother me. I thought, yeah, of course, send me it. So they sent me this dat, and I, and, I, and I did it at home on my own without Steve's musical help. And I remixed it out of tune, so it was in the wrong key. But basically, it was the beat for this. I'd remixed Say What You Want on top of this, and it was wrong. But they liked the music so much that they decided to do good advice, which is this track here. <laughs> in Lovenet Studios. Uh, I knew, I sort of thought something was up when they turned up and they were in loads of like very expensive Jeeps and cars. I thought, I'm living on biscuits and hashish here. What's going on with all this? Anyway, let's have a listen to the original where I got it from because it's was talked about on this, which was a movie that I was involved in about the history of library music, okay? So that's James Cameron, all right? And he did a track called Half Forgotten Daydreams and that's where the sample of this comes from. This makes you feel good, this song, I'll tell you. It's like audio morphine. So that's where good advice came from. Um, that went on to go six times platinum. This this version went on Texas is White on Blonde, and that went six times platinum. Uh, Andy Votel got remixes for their project, and um, basically it was a really good boost for the record label at this level. So you can see the face got behind us. That led to working with Charlene, which brought money to the label, to the artists. They got remixes for like five grand a piece. All good stuff, you know. Um, and it was a pleasure to be at the centre of that and try to make all that stuff happen. Because, of course, you know, we saw one on with Votel afterwards. And then obviously Justin had a great period since. Um, AIM did really well with Cold Water Music, Rain Christian did, um, and basically Mr. Scruff went on to greater things. There's a lot of different stuff going on. We're coming to the end here, the last side of this three pieces of vinyl that I did. By the way, um, if you buy this t-shirt, you get the whole album um, for free on the download. I think the album might be free to download anyway. Thanks to everyone who's been supporting the merchandise. It's been very helpful to me and I appreciate everything. Okay, so, original Stunt Master by AIM, which is a Bobby Womack sample, okay? The resulting dialogue shows a surprisingly warm and sensitive side to the man as he responds to the children's curiosity. Now, I'll introduce myself. 
myself, first of all, my name is Jerry Fogel. I'd like to welcome you to an afternoon with Evil Knievel. An informal question. So, yeah. You're going to have a good time asking me Evil Knievel. But there's a lot of vocals from Evil Knievel here, yeah? Devil of a man. Brilliantly chopped up by Andy. Uh, but the thing that's the best part about this is the way that he, like, sticks different parts of um, melody together. So the end of this song has got Womack and then two other parts. But the way they interact is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so you can see that, you know, the brilliance uh, is already there of sample choice and stitching together. Uh, so that's AIM. What else have we got? There's two more tracks. It's a crazy one from Andy Votel. Hemlocker. It's like doors opening. It's avant-garde stuff, yeah? Some proper madness from uh, Andy Votel. And then finally, to hit back on the social, on the soulful tip, it's Tony D with When We Get Together, which is a Grady Tate sample. And I just found it today on YouTube, but I couldn't steal it for you. Oh yeah. stuff from Tiny D. And that was a review of Central Heating, a very important album in the history of Grand Central, and certainly was the breakthrough album. And um, thanks to everyone who committed their artistic brilliance to the project, to Andy for the artwork, and for all of you for watching, and all the people who supported worldwide, but read the origins in the Victorian Industrial Revolution buildings of Manchester, all of these tracks were recorded in the same sort of places. They're now made into basically apartments, aren't they? But, you know, 25 years is a long time in socio-political history. And on that note, music will always be the saviour, okay? We couldn't have made this music without people working together with each other in closeness, inclusivity, black culture, white culture, northern co culture, southern culture. It's music, man. It's just basically what stitches us together. Thank you for watching. Central Heating t-shirts are available in my band camp now. Love to you all. Thank you. This has been Mark Ray with This Is How We Did It, Central Heating Listening Party. Peace.